Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Andrew. Rebalancing is a topic that we're very familiar with at the New York Times Company. For most of the past decade, we've been in the midst of a great rebalancing in the news industry between the producers of news on one hand and news consumers on the other. Historically, yeah, ah, thank you. Historically, the flow of news to the public has been unidirectional, with the balance of power favoring the great institutions of journalism like the Times. Our paper sat literally at the center of the news experience. People reached in and pulled out copies of the news we delivered. But journalism, like all of media, is undergoing a great rebalancing act, fostered by the internet and accelerated by the widespread adoption of smartphones and social media. In the research and development lab of the New York Times, we described this rebalancing as a paradigm shift. Our industry is transforming from a publishing paradigm to a communications paradigm. In a publishing paradigm, content sits at the center of the experience, and people are surrounding that content, reaching in to take it out as they need. In a communications paradigm, the individual consumer sits right at the center of the information experience, acting as both receiver and producer of increasingly granular, structured, fluid data. The data we focus on in the news industry consists of reported facts. And embedded within these facts are other data, such as people, places, and a rich and evolving collection of topical memes. So how do we as consumers extract meaning when the news is increasingly presented to us as a deconstructed flow of data? I would submit that meaning emerges when this flow of data encounters a human mind. For news exists at the intersection of the past with the present. And although news is experienced collectively, we each bring to it our personal memories and our personal experiences. And it persists in these memories in ways that are uniquely personal. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the so-called Chappaquiddick incident. But I am, so let me recount it for you. It was a tragic and scandalous tale involving a youthful American senator of regal lineage who, under suspicious circumstances, drove his car off of a pier and into a pond on the Massachusetts island known as Chappaquiddick. The senator escaped unscathed, but the same wasn't true of his passenger. Riding alongside him that night was a young woman by the name of Mary Jo Kopechny who tragically perished in the accident. For me, this story evokes memories far beyond the reported facts of the incident. First, I remember that word, Chappaquiddick, and how funny it sounded to a young boy from the Midwest, unaccustomed to the percussive timbre of Native American place names that dot the New England landscape. Second, this memory and this news story evokes a very palpable sense of place. But that place isn't the Massachusetts island with the funny name. No, that place is a trim, two-story, red brick colonial home just outside St. Louis, Missouri, where I lived in 1969 at a time that this story took place. But most of all, what this memory and this story evokes for me is the hushed tones in which my parents discussed its dark, prurient implications, wondering what might have transpired between that dashing senator and his fetching amanuensis. In short, for me, this news story makes me remember what it felt like to be a young boy on the brink of adolescence. <laughs> Each of us have rich, personal memories that intersect with the news stories we encounter in our lives. And it's in this connection between the news and our personal memories that these stories take on resonance and meaning. For meaning to emerge from a flow of unstructured data requires us to insert ourselves into that equation. Rebalancing the news, just like rebalancing the world, starts with each of us as individuals. Thank you. And 
Thank you. Now, I'd like to preview some work we're doing in the R&D lab at The Times that's exploring this intersection between memory and news. I want to introduce my colleague, Alexis Lloyd, who's a creative technologist in the R&D lab, who will demo this app for you. Good morning. Thank you, Michael. So what I'm going to show you this morning is a preview of an application that we're developing in the R&D lab called News Memory Maps. And this is our first exploration of how we might enable that intersection between personal memory and news data. And we're hoping it'll be something that will empower individuals to curate and annotate and share their own personal experiences as seen through the lens of major news events. So when I first entered the application, I begin by sharing a couple of personal details, so I can tell it when I was born. And then I can indicate different eras in my life, so I can drag these onto the timeline, I can add high school in here, and then I can drag those life phases onto a map to quickly indicate where I lived at different phases in my life. I'm a tried and true New Yorker, these are all going to the same place. And then I'm brought into the timeline, which is really the heart of the memory maps experience. And what this is, is a timeline of major news events that have occurred throughout my lifetime. And I can move back and forth in it, and as I move through it, events appear and change dynamically, showing me images and text as, as triggers to my own personal memory. So I can look for something that resonates with me. So here I see um, the 93 bombing of the World Trade Center, and for me, that was a moment, I was in high school, I was a senior in high school, about two blocks away from the World Trade Center. I was taking a history exam at the time and I remember the whole building shaking and not knowing what was going on. So as you can see, I dragged that image up from the bottom and now I'm starting to build my own personal memory map out of this soup of events. So I'm just gonna add a few more events here. I can tap on any of these event titles or drag any of these images up. I can move them up and down to indicate their relative importance to me. If I want to remove something, I just drop it off the bottom of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the real lovely thing about a live demo is then, that it, then it crashes on me. So <laughs> I'm going to start over again. <laughs> I'm just going to zoom right through this. And here we are again. All right. I won't remove anything this time. So I'll, uh, I'll add these events. Amy Fisher, hadn't thought about her in a while. <laughs> and one thing you'll notice is that you'll occasionally see these orange line graphs being drawn across the screen. And what those are, they're different indices that we've pulled out, everything from presidential approval ratings to um, the mentions of the word war in the New York Times to uh, the average price of a movie ticket. And these are things that give us a little context around the events that we're looking at. Something else you might notice is that I'm looking at a timeline, and you might expect this, that proceeds in equal increments. So each year on this timeline takes up the same amount of space on the screen. But as we were developing this, we were talking about that this isn't really the way we experience time, is it? So for example, the four years that I spent in college seemed to me to have taken a much longer time than, for example, the last four years of my life because of the density and richness of the experience there. So in order to make this interface reflect that experience of time in some way, we've allowed for people to toggle between real time and perceived time. So down in the bottom right here, if I switch into perceived time, these events stretch out. There's this time dilation effect so that periods of time with more events expand to fill their perceived importance to me. And once I've collected a number of events on my memory map, I might want to dive deeper into them to rediscover them, to remember what actually happened. And so to do so, I can simply uh, go into a reading mode, which is under development, so hopefully this will work. So I just rotate the iPad, and I go into a reading mode where I see um, short summaries of the events and links back to articles from the New York Times about that event. And I can go back into the timeline simply by rotating the iPad again. And so in this way, we're trying to use the reader's memory as a locus for anchoring and exploring this deep and rich archive of New York Times content. So this is an application that's in beta right now. You're the first people to see it. But you can imagine that as people begin to create and share these memory maps in large numbers that we can potentially access some really interesting insights here. 
So we can start to see aggregate views of what the meaningful events were for different types of people. What were the events that shaped the lives of women in their 20s as opposed to men in their 50s? Or we can start to get more granular. We can say, what were the seminal events for people who spent their childhoods in Eastern Europe in the 1980s? And so while memory maps begin with and are shaped around these intensely personal experiences, they can expand to allow us greater revelations about collective memory and our communal experiences of the news. Thank you very much. Thank you.